get this started. So we're now recording. I'm going to do my share screen and pull up the uh, pull up the uh, one that I want, which is this one. So everybody can see my slides, I assume, at this point. We got the home slide up there, uh, Debbie. Debbie. Yeah, it's fine. Looks good. Looks very okay, good. fine. All right. Well, we're recording now, and I just thought I would uh, thought we'd get started with this one. So, um, what we're looking at is our our uh, title slide, and like I said, uh, the session today is going to be for beginners. Uh, I've already uh, know that a few people in here have got a little bit of experience at winemaking, but hopefully you'll pick up some additional tips here next Saturday, and we'll be a little bit more a little more complex about it. But uh, we get started. So primarily, we're going to be talking about making muscadine wine at home. Um, I'm one of those people who moved to this area 14, 15 years ago, had no experience at all with muscadines. So I had a whole lot of things to learn. And one of the important things I had to learn was that um, you don't make muscadine wine the same way you make any of the other grape wines. <laughs> Not even close. Doesn't work. So I had to learn a whole new skill all over again, something I'd done for 40 years. Um, just for your information, I'm also a country winemaker. As we speak, I've got a five gallon jug of carrot wine bubbling in my kitchen. So I made lots of wine out of lots of different things over the years. But sort of to put um, where we are here um, in context, there's, there's, a couple of, um, there's a couple of things here that you need to know about the family of, of grapes that we're talking about here. Um, these are the, the common American grapes. Uh, these are the ones that most people have at least heard of. Um, you get the fox grape up there on the upper left, you know, the river grape down on the right. And across the bottom, we have all of those, um, all of those different types of native grapes that we have here, the Cayugas, which is almost a white grape, Niagara's, Catawba's, and Isabella, which is a subset, Concord's, and of course, the Norton and Cynthiana's. But the Muscadine is, is the family of grapes that we're talking about today. Um, very few people realize that we have in the state of North Carolina something like 25 or 26 known wild different varieties that are not commercially produced um, growing in the state. Most of the ones that are growing in the state came from uh, some wild stock that was developed uh, from these uh, wild muscadines that were growing in the state hundreds of years ago. So on the outline for today, we're going to be talking about some legal stuff. We always get asked how much wine can you make and that kind of stuff. We'll cover that. Uh, we're going to talk about the kind of supplies that you'll need. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some of the basic stuff. Uh, next week, we'll get into a little bit more advanced when you start getting serious at the hobby. <laughs> we're going to talk about some basic equipment that you might need. Um, we're going to talk about some uh, useful charts and tables that uh, I'll present to you. And of course, you'll get copies of these uh, probably in PDF format um, after the class is over. Uh, there's going to be some useful references, some things that you need to know about muscadines. Um, like I said, it's quite different from anything I'd had experiments with, and I had done a lot of, of winemaking over the years. But um, for today's session, you're going to be learning a little bit about chemistry and, and zymology. I hope it doesn't scare you off. Our, our ancestors were making wines years ago before they knew anything about anything. Most of them couldn't read and write, but um, they made passing quality wine just from uh, observation, trial and error. But <clears throat> today we'll be talking about some of the specific things to help make um, a really decent bottle of wine from um, the grapes that you're growing in your backyard. So the purpose of this class is to, is to really give everybody a chance to understand how to manage fermentation. That's, that's really what this is all about. So, um, if we, if we take a look at um, the uh, process that we get into a little bit here, it's, it's just really a little bit of chemistry, but it's not, it's not that hard. So first of all, how much wine can you legally make at home? Okay, here's the, um, the BTAF uh, section 24.75 that covers specifically um, making wine. Um, you can make 200 gallons a year for a household which has two or more adults living in there. Uh, if you're a single adult, you're allowed 100 gallons. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I used to make a lot of gallons. <laughs> and as try as hard as I may, I couldn't get past about 100. <laughs> 
Somebody's got background going on there. So anyway, um, that's uh, that's where we are. Um, 100 gallons a year means that's uh, 500 bottles. Um, that's a lot of wine. And like I said, uh, when I was making um, 18 to 24 six gallon jugs of wine a year, I, was, I couldn't give it away fast enough. It was, it was awful. And I kept track of it. I could only go through about 190, gal 190 bottles a year at my family of uh, two. So uh, that's a lot of wine. So if somebody's thinking it's somewhat limited, you got to be having a wine bottle in your mouth uh, just about all the time. But notice uh, down at the bottom, <clears throat> even though we can make alcohol legally, you can't concentrate it. That is, you can't run it through a still or do a freeze out on it, making grappa without a license. It's sort of a crazy thing in a way that let you make alcohol, but then now that you have it, you can't massage it or make anything out of concentrating it to make it into something else. So, but that's the way the law is and that's the way it works. <clears throat> so when you look at um, the question we get asked a lot of time is, um, what things actually impact the quality of wine that you make at home? And it's basically some simple things. One is the quality of your material source. Everybody who's ever made wine of any kind will tell you you can't make good wine out of um, crappy grapes or crappy apples or crappy fruit of any kind. So you, you've got to have a good uh, quality uh, material to start with. Uh, the second thing is the sanitation level. <clears throat> what we're talking about is controlling um, in some cases, control of uh, yeast growth and, um, and bacteria growth. So the sanitation level is something you have to pay attention to. Uh, there's an old adage out there for the beer makers that, that says the, uh, there's three secrets to making good beer, temperature control, temperature control, temperature control. And in winemaking, it's the same thing. There's three secrets to making good wine. It's cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness. So you gotta pay attention to that sanitation stuff. And then of course your ability to taste and test the wine that you're making and uh, know how to make some adjustments accordingly. So your ability to make the necessary adjustments of acidity, sweetness, and residual sulfites and so forth is, um, is going to be uh, tantamount to making good stuff. And then uh, your, your wine making skills. And that comes from just uh, paying attention to the recipes and the process and the gaining some experience. So let's see what we got here. Next slide is uh, about supplies. Now, you can make wine in crocks. Uh, when I was growing up, we had a five gallon crock behind the old wood stove in the corner where we were making wine or making homebrew constantly year round. But um, these days you can get a hold of some pretty good materials. Um, what I strongly suggest if you're just get, getting started into uh, winemaking at home is get yourself some, um, some jugs uh, the one on the far left there is uh, that's a little one gallon jug. I think we had some cider or something out from one of the local grocery stores. And of course, the big picture in the center there, that's a, a six and a half gallon jug. Um, that'll do about 30, uh, 30 bottles of wine. So that's, uh, that's a good size one. And uh, on the right hand side, you'll see some cups and spoons that you use for measuring. Because again, uh, winemaking is sort of like running a recipe for a cake or something. You have to pay attention to the ingredients Make sure you take care of the proper amounts and quantities you're dealing with. The second thing you'll need to supply after you've got your jug, <clears throat> center picture shows a little bit of uh, this particular one, some carrot wine. And this little thing on top up here is called an airlock. And the reason this is important is because the, the wine down here is, um, is bubbling. The uh, yeast is eating the sugar and releasing uh, alcohol and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide being a gas that starts to, to fizz up and bubble up through here. And you do not want air from the room going back into your jug. So you, the way you do this is you put this airlock on here and there's two different types. Here's one type and you can see the gas actually bubbling through the, the water that's in the airlock. And this is, uh, this is typical the way it works. There's another type that operates on the same principle you can see the gas uh, bubbling through the, uh, the liquid there to allow the CO2 to escape, but uh, keep the uh, room air out. The next thing you're gonna need is some bottles and some corks. Now, 
bottles and corks. Um, uh, if you get wine bottles from just well, what I do here is I just save them. I've got some neighbors who drink a lot of wine too, and I ask them to save bottles for me. You have to uh, soak off the labels, strip off the labels. Uh, we can get into that a little bit if you want. But uh, and the other thing is uh, you go buy them. I mean, you can buy bottles. Uh, they're pretty pricey if you want uh, nice bottles. But uh, I find that used ones work really well. Ones work. You wash them up and sterilize them and uh, perfectly uh, usable. Some of my wine bottles I've used probably 10 or 12 times over the years. And as long as they're not cracked or chipped, they continue to be a, a good container for your wine. And there's a standard package of uh, corks on the right hand side. Those are some uh, synthetic corks that you can buy. Um, <clears throat> they're, um, they're acceptable, but uh, generally speaking, try to buy the best quality wine uh, corks that you can get because the only two things protecting your, your wine is the glass bottle and the cork that's in it. And um, it's pretty hard to get a bad glass uh, bottle, but uh, it's very easy to get a bad cork and it won't protect your wine and, and it'll, it'll spoil on you if you don't have a good one. Of course, once you start corking up your things, you want to take a look at a couple of different ways to do this. Um, this is a hand corking machine. <clears throat> if you're going to be making a jug or two of wine, this is probably appropriate, but uh, you essentially put this down on the floor, insert a cork into it, put it over the top of the bottle and push down it with your hands and it inserts the cork into it. Um, these are available for like, like 39 bucks or something like that off of eBay. Um, and again, if you're just starting, uh, this is a pretty inexpensive way to get started um, on corking. Uh, I tend to make a little bit more wine, so I use something called a floor tabletop corking machine, where you're dealing with dozens and dozens of bottles. That other type of corker gets very tiring, not to mention hard on your back if you have to bend over and do it on the floor every time. Uh, I have a demonstration video of this. I'm going to show you how this works. Um, he's going to say a couple things I disagree with, but it's a demonstration of the bottle corking machine on what you see. So here's the way this works. Cork goes in dry. I haven't had to soak it or sanitize it. Right into the jar, pull down the handle, the platform locks. Voila. That's the way it's done, and it's just that fast. The only problem is that I have found that if you don't sterilize the top of that uh, corking machine and also soak your corks for a few seconds in some sterilizing agent, you will get uh, bacteria and some fungus growth in that wine that will destroy it. So his idea of not putting any um, clean cork on a thing is, is not a good idea. Okay, other supplies that you will need. <clears throat> You're going to need some yeast. <clears throat> Sorry. You're going to need some yeast. Uh, yeast come in uh, two different forms. It can be dry, like that little pouch over here, the Lalvin um, QA23 that's there. And these are uh, Y yeast, uh, liquid yeast here. They come in little vials and you just, you just pour it in. Uh, what I found is that the, uh, the uh, yeast, uh, for me, I prefer to use the uh, liquid yeast. It just seems to work better, but uh, I have used both. Um, if you're going to be making a lot of wine, um, it's probably going to be less expensive for you to do dry yeast because the liquid yeasts are a little pricier, but uh, it makes things happen a little bit faster. I like them for that reason. You might want to use some toasted oak chips if you want to have a little bit of tannin in your uh, wine. Um, most of the uh, muscadines I don't bother, but some of the others I do, but just in case you do, you know, teach up it. You can use uh, oak chips or oak powder, and it gives that little such a flavor to it. You also want to use something right here called potassium metabisulfite. Uh, this um, is a powder that you mix up with some water and it actually is a sterilizer. It kills the rogue yeast and the mus and it helps protect your wine once it's in the bottle. Uh, once in a while, <clears throat> especially if you're working with muscadines and scuppernongs, you're going to have to uh, uh, add some sugar to it. Uh, some people call it chaptalizing but you need to get that up to get the potential alcohol and your uh, must up to uh, 10 and a half percent alcohol. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And you may want to use some yeast or neutralizers, something like that to, uh, to help along getting the uh, thing going. Uh, sometimes uh, the, uh, you'll have something called a stuck fermentation and you'll have to add some additional energizers or nutrients into that to get the yeast started again to finish your, your fermentation. You're going to need some basic testing equipment. Um, these next two pieces are the ones that uh, I use. This one is um, 
It's called a hydrometer, that, that photograph on the left. And you put it in the liquid that would be the uh, actually wine that you're measuring and you let it float. And then you read the top where the water is on this little gauge over here. And the way you read this is the correct reading is at the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, do not read across the top. That's the wrong way to read it. You read it on the bottom right here. Okay. But uh, those are two basic pieces of equipment that I strongly urge that you use if you're going to be making wine at home <clears throat> as a beginner. The other thing that I have here, um, I primarily use this out in the vineyard when I'm checking to see if my grapes are ripe. It's called a refractometer. And essentially you put a drop of uh, juice on this flat surface here and flap this little uh, plastic down over top of it. And you look through here and the refraction of the light caused by the sugar in there gives you the reading here. And where this little blue line is that you're reading. So this one's reading about 14 and a half bricks. And 14 and a half bricks is about what you would see on uh, muscadines when it's uh, ripe. And that's going to give you roughly a 7% uh, alcohol wine and that's not high enough to get you beyond where you need to be to prevent the bad guys from growing in your wine so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is the uh, chart that uh, I call the specific gravity um, alcohol chart and I've got a red line under here because this is what I was just mentioning on the previous chart uh, slide this uh, ten and a half percent alcohol uh, all of the winemakers in the world sort of hold their breath until their wine gets up to 10.5% alcohol because this is the point of which 99.9% .9 of all the bad actors, the virus and bacteria and so forth that's growing in there can no longer survive and those, therefore it becomes um, less of a health risk and, and no problem for making somebody sick or, or something with the wine. So you really want to get this up to 10.5% and one of the reasons that we have to work with um, chaptalizing and muscadine wines because typically uh, coming off of the um, coming off the vine you'll have this reading here around 14 to 15 bricks and this shows you're only getting about an eight percent um, alcohol potential and that's not good enough you've got to get above ten and a half and so you have to add sugar to the uh, the wine must until you get it up to ten and a half percent so that uh, it will be safe to drink Another piece of basic testing equipment I strongly suggest that beginners get is um, a titratable acid uh, test kit. And it's, uh, it's a very, very simple thing. If anybody's ever been around swimming pools, it's very similar to a swimming pool um, um, testing kit. Um, this is what you get in the kit is the box on the left over here. You get this little bottle of sodium hydroxide and you get this other little phenolphthalein thing over here. And um, usually you get um, either a little tiny syringe a little tiny vial so that you can actually mix up. And it's not, uh, it's not difficult to use. Uh, the instructions are slightly different on different manufacturers, but uh, the idea is the same. You wanna find out what the total titratable acid is because that will determine um, many, many important things for you in, in the quality of the wine that you're producing. So if you want to uh, adjust your wine, this is, um, this is sort of one of the basic general rules of thumb for making wine. You really want to get that TA to be 0 0.6 to 0.8 on the uh, on the titratable acid. And so if you're measuring, uh, for example, you've measured your mind must and it says 3.5. Um, I'm sorry, if you're, if you're reading the, um, the, uh, well, the total acidity it actually comes out 0.3 is the way it works. Anyway, so this tells you what your total acidity is over here. And then the, <clears throat> this tells you if you want to get that up to six grams per liter or eight grams per liter, this is the one I prefer for preservation and so forth, stability of my wine, is this tells you how many grams or how many ounces um, of the uh, tartaric acid to add to get your, uh, uh, to get that residual you need in there for, uh, for preservation. Uh, this is probably one of the most difficult things for most people to uh, play with, but uh, after you've done it a couple of times, it becomes second nature to you. This uh, next one is the uh, pH. Uh, pH is uh, somewhat different from um, the uh, total acidity. And uh, we tend to pay a lot of attention to the pH um, because this is what gives you your direct impact on the uh, mouthfeel, uh, uh, the um, acid taste, you will, well, if you think about it that way, of, of a glass of wine when you're tasting it. So, 
uh, unfortunately, a pH doesn't have units. It's a logarithmic scale. So it means every time you jump one, it's a multiple of 10. So here is lemon on the far left here. Uh, most sweet wines have a pH around three. Light bodied wines, 3.1. Red and white wines, 3.5. Low acid red wines, 3.8. And generally speaking, you just won't find any commercial wines anywhere near this um, 4.0 or whatever that goes past here. Uh, coffee is a, is a low acid uh, material. And of course, uh, water is a neutral right at seven. So um, most wines that I make at home are between 3.1 and, and uh, 3.6. That's the range that I shoot for on the acidity for my taste uh, seems to work out quite well. And just to help uh, alleviate a little bit of the confusion of the pH versus titratable acidity, um, I put this uh, chart up there because uh, it helps define these two things a little bit. As you can see, uh, the definition gets to be a little bit uh, involved in chemistry. Sorry about that. But um, it's, it's, it's a difference between um, two units that you're going to have to play with um, and work with if you're going to make good wine. And you need to just understand how they interact with each other and, and uh, which one's more important for which reasons. But um, the pH uh, is a, a device or thing that you can measure with meter or test strips and uh, the titrate of acidity with that uh, special test kit that we talked about. Okay, so um, trying to get everything ready and get ready to go. Um, you've got some bottles, you've got your jugs. And when I said earlier, the three secrets to making good wine is cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So that means you have to clean and sanitize everything. Bottles, glasses, corks, tubing, caps, stirs, carboys, and even your hands. I, I usually use a, a little bit of a wash tub thing to sanitize everything. And I go right into that, right up to my elbows to make sure that everything I've gotten I'm touching during the cleaning process is also uh, sterilized. You want to really keep any unwanted, we call them rogue, bacteria, mold and fungus growing in your wine. And in order to do that, you've got to pay a lot of attention to the, the sanitation of what you're doing. And you only want the yeast and bacteria that you choose for fermenting wine to be allowed to thrive and grow. And uh, we, can, uh, we can pretty much guarantee that by making sure you sanitize everything. So there's three different ways of sanitizing things. <clears throat> Again, there's some of the supplies that you might want to think about getting for making wine at home. You're going to need one of these. Um, the first one is called step one. Step one is, um, it's, it's actually a combination of a cleaner and sterilizer, uh, sanitizer. Um, the dosage recommended on the bottle is one teaspoon per gallon of warm water. Uh, and that means uh, you're going to require a 25 minute soak. So if you're sterilizing or cleaning bottles, uh, you'd have to put these down into a container or sink basin or something full of uh, warm water and uh, add your uh, tablespoon per gallon and then let those bottles or whatever else, tubing or whatever, sit there and soak for 25 minutes. So that's, that's one option. Another option is called um, iotaphore. Uh, this is the one that I use. I prefer this one because uh, uh, it's faster. As you can see down there, it's a 60 second soak. And uh, the uh, dosage on this is two caps. The caps on top of the bottle are two caps per five gallons. So it's pretty potent stuff. Um, the problem with this is it's a sanitizer. It's not a cleaner. Uh, I always mechanically wash my, uh, my jugs and my bottles by hand with uh, good soap and water before I make sure the labels are off and all that kind of thing before I start the uh, cleaning and sanitizing. So, but this is my preferred one. Uh, again, it's a personal choice, just showing what these options would be. The final one is uh, potassium metabisulfite. Um, potassium metabisulfite is uh, a uh, sanitizer only. <clears throat> like I said, you still need a cleaner, just like for I-4. It's two ounces per gallon of water. Uh, this one's even faster. It requires a 20 second soak. And uh, it also works great in a spray bottle if you want to just sort of temporarily spray something when you're working with the wines like a cork or, or you touch something accidentally, you want to fix up the clean the edge of the container or something. The uh, spray bottles a, is a nice idea. Uh, again, it's a personal choice. Um, over the years, I've made uh, thousands and thousands of bottles of wine. So 
My, uh, my preference is the Ida 4, but again, I've used both of these other ones. Uh, they do have their place. Um, it's just a personal choice, but uh, once you start working with them, you can figure it out and, and see which one works best for you. There's some um, fundamental winemaking equipment that um, you will need. Uh, these are not very expensive items. Um, Chuck, before you move on from the cleaning, I ha we have two questions about that. Yep. Um, one is, is there any kind of device that you can use uh, to clean previously used carboys, jugs, and bottles? Some kind of a rotating brush device or steamer or anything like that? That was the question. Or is it just basically elbow grease and, you know, getting inside those containers? Is there a best way to do to clean those used containers? <clears throat> It's a good question. Uh, the answer is, this is beginning winemaking. It's going to be elbow grease. And they make special brushes for cleaning bottles. They make special brushes for cleaning those carboys. Okay. Um, and then there's another question. Do the sanitizers require a rinse after you put the sanitizer on? No. Okay. That's a quick answer. Uh, uh, I guess those are our two questions. Uh, feel free to go on now to your next um, next section there. <clears throat> okay, so uh, some basic winemaking equipment that uh, you're going to need if you're working with grapes. Now, uh, I have not been able to find any place yet muscadine uh, winemaking kits where you can get the concentrate. Um, you can find uh, muscadine juice for sale here and there. But for us backyard vineyardists, we, uh, we always go with uh, our own grapes most of the time. And so you will need a couple of basic pieces of equipment. The one on the left is a, is a mechanical grape crusher. And I wanna make sure that we understand the difference between crushing and pressing. Crushing does nothing more than break the skin of the grape. You put your grapes in that little wooden hopper on the left and turn that handle and the gear teeth don't even come together to mesh. It comes within about uh, a quarter of an inch of each other and don't touch. And all it's meant to do is break the skin on the grape so that it gives access to the pulp and juice inside for the uh, yeast to get in and start doing its work, okay? Pressing means you've now crushed the grapes, the fermentation has taken place, and now you want to squeeze all of the juice out of that that you can get out of it. So in order to do that, you need a press bag <clears throat> for, the, for the actual wine press. Um, you'll see in that center picture, there's a, a little bit of a, uh, it looks like a nylon mesh sort of thing here in the industry, they call it a jelly bag. And you basically put your um, grape must and so forth down in here, your seeds and skins and so forth. And then you fold over the top of this, this uh, screen material, this uh, jelly bag material. Then you put it in a press and press down on it. And what this bag does, it, it keeps the, the juice, uh, allows the juice to go through the screen on the inside, but not plug up the little slats on the side where the juice comes out. Um, I tried doing this once without a bag and it made a mess. It took me an hour to clean it up. What a mess. So you really need a jelly bag if you're gonna have a little press. And the picture you see on the right-hand side, there's two different types of presses. There's a little small one and there's a big one. The one I have right now is like the little small one on the left. Uh, it works fine. Uh, if you're doing home wine making, you can pick this up for inexpensive. Sometimes you can find them used on eBay and so forth, but uh, you'll definitely need some kind of a press, especially with muscadines. They have such a thick skin. It's a little bit harder sometimes to press that out than it is regular grapes. But uh, this, this is some basic equipment that you're, you're gonna need to, um, to make wine at home. My suggestion is you got two or three neighbors who are interested, sort of a share and joint, uh, that kind of stuff. I've got people that I borrow equipment from once in a while. And I've got people who borrow my equipment once in a while, but uh, it's only used once a season. <laughs> and uh, once it's done, if you're a backyard home winemaker type person, then it's gonna sit and uh, collect dust for the rest of the time, <clears throat> unless you put in a kind of a story chamber. Okay, so you've started um, making a wine and it turns out to be a little bit cloudy, a little bit hazy. So you've got to have something called the clarifiers uh, or finers or fining. 
And this is, um, this is something that comes from a lot of experience of working with different kinds of fruits and, and the vegetables and, and so forth. Um, grapes tend to have um, um, the biggest, at least I have found, the biggest variety of, of problems uh, that have to be taken care of. This. So my favorite um, clarifier is time. Uh, I don't uh, rack or siphon off my wines into clean jugs ever so often like a lot of people do. I just let it sit on the lees. I found this to be very beneficial from a flavor point of view. It uh, gives less chance for contamination and thing. And uh, I'll just let it sit. And sometimes it'll take six, eight months for that to start to clear. And when it does, it'll just very slowly clear up and it'll take three or four days and it'll actually they'll fall out and you'll be able to read a newspaper through your jug of wine. Uh, the second thing is <clears throat> if I wait my period of time for muscadines, for example, it's six months, regular grapes is 12. <clears throat> and if I don't see that, clearing, then I will go to my refrigerator, uh, basically put my jug in the refrigerator and leave it overnight. And that uh, cooling off down to um, 38 to 40 degrees typically will cause uh, anything that's causing cloudiness in there, haziness in your wine to actually precipitate out. And uh, that allow you to siphon off the clear line off the top of it, and it'll be fine. <clears throat> if refrigeration and time do not work for me, it happens about one out of 10 times that one of those two will not work for me. What I refer to is super clear. <clears throat> super clear is a, a combination of uh, kiosasol and nikitasan, which actually is derived from shellfish. And this will take care of both positive and negative, uh, negatively charged uh, proteins and things that are floating around in the water causing your haziness. And I have never ever in my lifetime had a wine fails to clear from using super clear. And that's why I prefer this one. There are, some, there are many other options. For example, you can use activated carbon. Um, I found that in some cases it starts taking out some of the flavor components. I'm not happy with what comes out the other side, but it works. Uh, some people like it and use it, it's fine. You can use crushed eggshells. <clears throat> you can use the diatomaceous earth. You can use something called uh, polyvinyl pyridinone or PVP. Uh, all of these are available for sale in uh, wine shops. Uh, there's another one called polyclar. Um, the old fashioned people, the way they used to do it years ago, I had some neighbors years ago, used to make a dandelion wine and some other wines and they would use milk, uh, two or three drops per gallon as a clarifier. And uh, that, would, uh, that would do the trick. Some other things you can use is uh, egg whites. Um, by the way, I have tried all of these, and that's how I've come to the conclusion that I prefer the top three on the left kind column over here, but I've used these. It works. But um, the egg whites only works if you have something that's causing haziness that has a, a positive charge on it. Um, some people use gelatin. Again, it works for positively charged things. Uh, Ising glass, which is uh, made from fish scales, again, works for positive things only. Uh, casein and caseinates. Um, Kytosan, Sparkaloid is another uh, common one that you, could, you buy in the, uh, in the stores. And there's another one called the uh, Enolfin, because it's all combination. This one only works for negatively charged particles. Uh, bitnite clay is pretty good for negatively charged particles. Um, but uh, those are the things that you can use. Uh, again, it's something that uh, home wine makers may want to play around with, experiment with to see what works best for you but I've shared with you my experience on this one and, and that's the ones that uh, seem to work. The other thing you'll have to learn just a little bit about, again, I'm gonna talk about chemistry, just a touch here. Uh, we're talking about sulfites for wine preservation. Um, it's been used in winemaking for over hundred years. Um, wine yeast actually produces small amounts of uh, sulf sulfites uh, during fermentation and um, Typically, you'll find around the world that good wine making practices call for adding 50 to 100 parts per million of, um, of sulfites in, in your wine for preserving it and keeping it from spoiling once you put it in a bottle and put it in a cellar. Um, and what happens if you, if you actually put the dosage in at the time of bottling, uh, you'll find uh, uh, the residual that's actually in the bottle then is reduced to uh, 30 to 50 parts per million because uh, the difference between those two is reacting with things that would have caused your uh, wine to go bad. Uh, currently, the United States regulations 
for commercial wines require warning on labels. It says it contains sulfites. And that's uh, for wines containing more than 10 parts per million sulfur dioxide. So one of the questions I get a lot of time is somebody will say, oh, gee, I'm, I'm allergic to sulfites. I don't want to do that. Um, it turns out that there's about 10% of the population that, that says or claims to be they're allergic to sulfites. So my question to them is, can you eat dried apricots or dried peaches? Because if you can and you don't break out or get the hives or whatever, that contains about 5,000 parts per million sulfites. So you're probably allergic to something else other than the sulfites in the wine. Okay, <clears throat> in order to test this, the last piece of test equipment I suggest for beginners is this one. These are free sulfite test strips. All you do is follow the directions. You dip these little uh, uh, strips of paper into your wine and you look for the resulting color. Uh, this works perfectly on uh, white wines. Red wines gets a little bit more difficult because the red wine tends to uh, interfere with the color strips just a little bit, but if you pay close attention to it, you'll be able to figure it out. But um, those can be had for just a couple bucks uh, at any wine supply shop. And uh, jumping back into some chemistry stuff for a moment, it turns out that um, the free sulfites in the wine is really highly dependent upon the uh, pH. <clears throat> and you can see here, you got the pH of the wines, typical range here on the left. Um, this range in here that I've circled in, uh, or put this block around in red is typically the, the range of wines that I make between uh, 3.1 and 3.8 pH, depending on type. Um, you're looking for um, residual sulfites of uh, say 50 parts per million. Um, this is uh, what you need to be adding is 39 to 63 if the pH is uh, 3.7. So it just really depends upon uh, what your pH is as to how much uh, free sulfite is gonna be needed to protect your wines. So obviously the, uh, the higher the pH, uh, the more you're gonna need, but uh, just a little reference chart for you to, to pay attention to. Okay, let's take a look at some other uh, supplies. This would be my uh, last suggestion on this is uh, racking. Uh, racking is just a funny word for siphoning. Uh, those of us who grew up in the mountains learned very early about siphoning gas out of gas tanks. Uh, sometimes you get a mouthful of gasoline, that's not too good, but that same technique is used for siphoning wine. It's not particularly uh, sanitize, <laughs> sanitary, but it works. Um, so this picture on the left shows this lady uh, actually siphoning some wine out of a jug into the thing, and she's had to get it started by using that, that uh, suck on the hose uh, technique to get it started. Uh, what I have found that works quite well is something called an auto siphon. And this auto siphon is sort of like a little special pump arrangement, but you only have to do it like once or twice and it gets the thing started and it just continues. It's really a fantastic device. I think you can buy them for like 19 bucks, something like that from a home supply, uh, wine supply shops, but you stick this thing down in your jug of wine and you basically give this thing a pump once up and down and it will, it will start the wine up this pump down the tube. And I have um, a, a little video here to show you exactly how it works. So it's pumping it once and you get it started and that's all you have to do. And if you look down the bottom, it just keeps on coming until it gets down to the bottom of the jug on top. So the auto siphon is, uh, is one that I'd be recommended, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of winemaking at home because this saves a lot of time. It's much cleaner um, and faster to, to use than uh, the uh, other methods. We need to uh, pay attention just uh, briefly for a moment. Uh, you need to know that there's uh, three different origins of uh, wine aromas or, or smells. Um, the we call them the primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary is the one that actually comes from the grape. So whatever is in the grape naturally, that's going to be your primary aroma. Um, the secondary aroma is going to be uh, fermentation derived. That means uh, it really is dependent upon what you put in your fermentation to get started. The, the nutrients can impact uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, of aromas on there. And certainly the yeast in many cases, um, the choice of the uh, proper yeast will give you an improved uh, secondary aroma on, on your wines. And of course, then uh, tertiary aromas come from uh, aging 
And uh, this happens because uh, certain chemicals in the wine become oxidized over time, and that helps to develop the complexity and, and, uh, and the flavor of, uh, and, and the smell of the wine. So just, just be aware that there's three different things that contribute to it. So you've got a few different things to play with here. Um, most important as a home winemaker is a choice of the proper or the correct uh, yeast in order to get the flavors that you're looking for. So uh, let's look at actually uh, muscadine winemaking compared to other types of wines. Um, Scuppernongs were used to make the first American wine in colonies back in the early 1500s. <laughs> Problem was they tried to apply uh, vinifera winemaking techniques to it and it turned out so bad they couldn't drink it. So for about 150, 200 years, what they did is they brought over high wine from Europe and uh, mixed it with scuppernong juice and they sold that as wine. That, that's the way scuppernong wine was sold in the first couple hundred years here. Uh, modern researchers have called it the muscadine, they call the muscadine the smart grape because it has some other uh, good benefits to it from a medicinal, medicinal point of view. Uh, one of the important things to remember compared to regular wine grapes, if you've made wine like I had for years, you cannot leave the, um, the uh, juice uh, on the skins for more than a few hours. Uh, if you do, you will extract some flavor components that you cannot fix and you will not be able to drink. It is so bad. Uh, other grapes, it's usually somewhere between, you, you get to get that color extraction, you leave it on the skins for about uh, 10 days to two weeks, sometimes a little bit longer. But in muscadines, it's a few hours. And I'm talking like four to six hours, no more. Or you start extracting that just horrendously tasting thing out of there you do not want. Uh, muscadines has a high acid um, naturally. Uh, and one of the other differences between muscadines and regular grapes is muscadine wine is ready to bottle in, uh, in six months. So um, just talking about some general things, it's the nature of the muscadine grapes. They have thicker skins. They're higher in uh, aromatic uh, polyphenols. Um, of course, the grape itself is just really aromatic. I can smell them when they're ripe 50 feet away. Uh, there's a low natural sugar content, which means you got to chaptalize, add sugar to it. Uh, it basically has low to no tannins, which is a little unusual even for the red ones. Uh, it has very low pH. It's a medium to high uh, titratable acidity. It's a very high allergic acid content, which is good for your health. Um, it's a lower nitrogen content, which means you're gonna add some uh, nutrients to keep your yeast working. Um, it has a high tendency to oxidize very quickly. So you want to make sure that you uh, preserve it and keep it away from air during the whole wine, wine making process as, as best you can. It has a high level resveratrol, which is a good um, anti-cancer, anti-aging agent. Uh, is a medium level of proteins compared to other grapes. It has a higher disagreeable polyphenol in the seeds, and this is what gives you that soak time problem that I was telling you about earlier, that you do not want to leave this on for weeks. You'll pull that stuff out and you will not be able to fix it. And of course, um, the other thing from the growing grapes, those of you who attended class last week, is the ripening happens over an extended period of time, which requires multiple harvests. And here on our vineyard, we, we harvest the first week of September, and then we come back in the second week, and the third week, and the fourth week. And if the delay, the frost is delayed another week into October, we get a fifth harvest out of there. Uh, and you can only harvest the ones that are ripe. That's in that uh, 14 to 16 bricks range category we're talking about. So uh, the nature of muscadines and all winemaking is uh, we, we hope to produce something called a balanced wine. Now, when I'm working with wine judges and so forth, when we do our competitions out here, what, what, the, what gives you the very highest scores on well-made wine is something called a balanced wine. That means it's got a nice body to it. It's got maybe some residual sugar and the pH and the total acidity is everything in balance. So that when you actually taste it, um, not one of those things is slapping you in the face. I mean, you, you don't have the acidity. It's so acid, it just gives you a terrible bite and you can't stand it with the pH. Uh, the sugar is so high and syrupy that, that it's unpleasant and so forth. So you're looking for a really well-balanced wine. And in order to get there, you have to do a couple things. First of all, you have to, to, to pay attention to your alcohol potential before pitching a yeast. 
Uh, we talked about that. Make sure that, that gets up over 10 and a half percent potential alcohol. Uh, number two, you want to constantly monitor your um, uh, titratable acidity and your pH. Uh, uh, make sure that that's all starting at right whenever you get into the uh, pitching the yeast and get it going. And then you want to taste it from time to time and compare your tasting to what your instrumentation is telling you about your wine. Uh, I'm, I'm one that likes to taste things and, and look at the instrumentation, and tell me uh, what's happening on the two. So, uh, but again, just know that uh, there's several different elements here in home winemaking you have to pay attention to, to, to come out with a uh, decent bottle of wine. Um, one of the other things that we have learned about muscadines, which is a little bit different from regular grapes, is that uh, the, um, the, due to the nature of the chemistry of the grape, relative, relatively small changes in added sugar changes the aromatic profile significantly. And I had no idea how bad this was or how strong it was until I did some testing on this last year. I found out that uh, somebody joined with their. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, last year I did a little bit of experimenting with it, and, and I was astounded how little bit of sugar added to it made such a change in the uh, profile of the, uh, of the wine. So I thought I'd throw this in here just in case you wanted to uh, do some measurements and uh, see where it, it uh, works out for you. Okay, so now we're getting ready to, to uh, start in to make some wine, get everything ready. So get your equipment out. Uh, you're going to need a primary fermenter. It can be a six to eight gallon bucket with a lid would be preferable. I like to use the food grade plastic ones. Um, the ones that you can buy from uh, the Home Depot in a food grade plastic bucket area, it works fine. Uh, they also have them at uh, Lowe's. Uh, any one of the uh, uh, restaurants around town that buys uh, quantities of uh, foods in those plastics, sometimes they'll give you those buckets for free if you just ask for them, but they're very nice uh, food grade plastic. Don't use the other ones. They all exude some plastic uh, components out into the wine you won't like. Uh, for secondary fermenter, um, the way I make wine here is always use uh, glass. This says a five gallon narrow neck carboy, preferably glass, assuming you'll be making a five gallon batch could be a one gallon. Uh, you want an airlock. Again, as we said earlier, to allow the carbon dioxide to escape and keep out the air. You're gonna need some kind of a siphon. It takes about six feet of food grade plastic tubing or an auto siphon. Uh, both of those are available from any wine supply shop or online. Uh, you'll need a small crusher in order to break the skins of the grapes. Uh, I know people who've done this by hand by putting them in a bag, honest to God, and smashing it with a wooden mallet not exactly the, <laughs> the cleanest way to do things, but I guess it works for them. And uh, I didn't get taste their wine, but they said it was okay. But uh, I find a little crusher like always better. And then you need a strainer of some kind, uh, like a jelly bag uh, and a small wine press to, um, to um, actually strain it out and, and get your uh, juice going. Uh, on the supply side, you need to setting aside ready to work with is uh, your wine yeast. Uh, what I found works best for um, the uh, muscadine is either uh, EC1118 or Lalvin RC212 or Scott Labs W15. Any one of those yeasts will work well, um, but those are the, the ones that I have found that work best. And some of my friends who've been wake, making wine out of muscadines for a long time also uh, agree with that. Uh, you'll need some Camden tablets. Uh, Camden tablets is nothing but uh, pelletized uh, potassium metabisulfite and you'll just crush those up and put those in your, your must. And that kills off the wild bacteria and the yeast found on the food skins. And then later acts as a preservative too, but uh, that, that's the primary function of to get rid of the wild bacteria. And then uh, you'll need grapes. Now, in order to do um, uh, five gallons of muscadine wine, because the skins are so thick and um, um, it tends to um, not squeeze out as well as uh, regular grapes, uh, you're gonna need somewhere between 80 and 90 pounds. Um, I've tried this twice here with the grapes I use and it takes right at 90 pounds to give me uh, five gallons of wine. Uh, the yeast nutrient, which you will need because uh, as I said earlier, the muscadine wines as low in the nitrogen content. So you'll need to get some nutrient in there to keep your uh, uh, fermentation from getting stuck. Uh, the one that I like uh, that also other people have told me about is uh, Lalamon Fermade O. 
Uh, again, this is available through uh, winemaking shops. Um, for chaptalizing, I tend to use turbine auto sugar. As you know, um, it's a little bit better, slightly more expensive than regular cane sugar. <clears throat> but uh, for home winemakers, uh, the difference in price in that is, is minuscule. But uh, I found out it just works much better. It dissolves faster and so forth. Uh, and you really just want to boil the water and sugar and let it cool down and use it. And it's basically a mixture of uh, simple sugar that's mentioned up above is, is uh, turbinado sugar, a one-to-one -one mixture with water that's been boiled and cooled. And anyone who's non-chlorinated water, a lot of beginning winemakers make the mistake if they live in a city of using water out of the tap in order to uh, make up some water things, make up your simple sugar, so forth. And that is not a good idea. That chlorine in the water will um, either kill or suppress the, um, the uh, chemical reactions that you want to be taking place with your yeast. So please use distilled water or reverse osmosis water, uh, not city chlorinated water. So we're ready to go. You've been out in the vineyard. You've, you've got your basket full of uh, grapes here on the left. Um, I go through and ba basically do a little rinse off of them, shake them around a little bit, get most of the water out of there, and then uh, put them in my basket and uh, with my little jelly bag in there and start cranking down that press and the juice starts pouring out into your bucket. So now we're ready to go. Okay, so the next thing we wanna talk about here is uh, the wine recipe. Um, I put together this one slide here that you'll get a copy of, but it's this, uh, been around the horn a couple of times with this. This seems to work the best for me. Um, if we're using the components and the equipment that we talked about earlier in the presentation, uh, you're gonna make some pretty decent wine out of this. <clears throat> and there's two, um, two directions here, one for white muscadines, you see with the purple lettering and one for uh, paragraph number two for red muscadines. Um, it's important that you pay attention to your, your TA and your bricks as you, as you go forward. You've gotta get that potential alcohol up to um, over 10%. Next, you want to uh, put in your simple sugar, uh, get your uh, hydrometer reading. So um, you don't want it to go over about 20 bricks. Um, there's a couple little uh, suggestions in there on how to read this, that, and the other, but uh, I'm not going to read it to you. You're capable of reading. And uh, item number three down there is let the wine ferment and age for six months. Uh, most regular grapes in the world, that number is 12 months, but um, again, Muscadines and scuppernongs are a little bit unique um, in many ways, and including the aging part of it, but uh, we found that six months worked fine. Um, after six months, you make your final check of your titratable acidity and the taste test. Uh, you can make any sweetness or acidity adjustments prior to bottling. That's the point uh, where you're pretty much past the point of no return. So before you put it in the bottle, make sure it's what you want and uh, it, it fits your uh, taste preferences. Uh, some people like to have a little sweeter, some people like to have a little drier, whatever, but that's the point that you make your, your decisions on the wine that you've made. Um, <clears throat> and number five, does, if you put it, get ready to bottle, <clears throat> dissolve one crushed tamped in tablet in a small cup of water and add it to the carboy. <clears throat> and that will give you the uh, reservation capability you need to protect your, uh, your wine. And then finally, bottle it and cork it. It's uh, ready to drink now once it comes <clears throat> out of that. But uh, we found it actually tastes a little bit better if you can wait about six months more uh, before you start drinking it. So that's the uh, Muscadine wine recipe that I played with and seems to work well here. Uh, I've had this confirmed by a couple of other people too. So if you got any questions on this, I'll wait for somebody to ask a question. No question. Thank you, Chuck. I do have some questions in the in the chat while people are um, getting their thoughts together. Um, uh, I was one one of the questions I had is sort of what's a, what's the sort if somebody is really making wine for the first time, do you think that five gallons or is a is a good place to start? You know, could people is it worth people messing around with with smaller quantities um, uh, if they can get the you know, the, the containers and, and tools together for it? Uh, <clears throat> I'm probably suggesting that the five gallons is probably not 
a good place to start for most home winemakers who've never done this before. Mm -hmm. I would strongly suggest a one gallon. All you have to do is take that recipe and divide things by five and you got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you have, if you get into serious winemaking and you want to start doing testing things like I do on making unusual country wines, you will need a completely different set of instruments. You'll need a microgram scale that's capable of measuring fractional grams of things because the concentrations of things you need to put into a pint of wine that you're making is very, very small. <laughs> and uh, you'll, you'll need a set of micro spoons. I mean, it's, you can do it, I've done well, it. Well, this beginner class here. Wait, I, I don't understand, but I'm just saying, you, you can make it as small as you want, but you'll just need different equipment to do it. One gallon is perfectly doable by dividing everything on that slide by five. Sounds great. Okay, okay so another question that came to me was, do you use pectic enzyme in the must? No. Uh, that sounds, okay. You got to explain pectic, what that is, then it's, I don't have a clue. Pectic enzyme is for fruit wines. Okay. Apples, berries, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. And then the question came in, does the winemaker have to use sulfites or I actually have to add sulfites? Why? Does the, do you have to add them? I mean, can you just ignore that whole thing? This is a personal preference thing. Uh, I have made thousands of bottles of wine without adding sulfites, but I have had ultra clean environment where I was actually filtering the air where I was actually putting all this stuff together. And it has held for 10 years in some cases. I don't recommend it for beginning winemakers because it's just too easy to get just one little bit of contamination from someplace and it'll ruin your wine. Mm -hmm. And, and can you explain what those Camden tablets were? Uh, that, uh, that was not the something Camden I saw. Camden tablets is pelletized. It's a pressed tablet made out of potassium metabisulfite that I had mentioned earlier in the list of supplies. Okay. Okay. I missed that. So uh, other people have questions, raise your hand, type them in uh, or blurt them out. I know he's moving on to some more aspects of this. So. All right. Go ahead, Chuck. Okay, so uh, you've made your bottles of wine now, and uh, what do I do with it? I've got a uh, five gallon jug of wine here, and, and out of that five gallons, I've been able to get uh, 25 bottles of wine. Can't drink it all tonight, I don't think. So what are you gonna do to store it? And it's typical, the same for <clears throat> all kinds of wines. You really need to put your wine in place that's dark, Light will actually damage your wine, especially the red wines. It'll start fading it out. I've actually put it in a glass in the sunlight and watched it happen. So uh, if you're going to store your wine, put it in a dark place. Number two, make sure it's cool, not cold, but cool. Uh, 55 to 65 degrees is, is the, the preference for uh, storing wines. And you want to make sure that it's... it's <laughs> When I say free of vibrations, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, living vibrations, but I'm talking about machine vibrations like a, a refrigerator or some machine or something vibrating in the cabinet next to it, that kind of thing. Uh, you just need to not be vibrating your, your wine. Uh, that'll accelerate its uh, oxidation and, and degradation, but uh, dark, cool, and, and calm. That should be <laughs> where you store your wine. And then uh, we talked about aging your wine. Um, if you want to age your wine, again, um, you can drink it right after you bottle it. You've been uh, letting it sit there, fermenting and so forth for uh, six months. Um, I have drank it at that point and it's, it's pretty good, but I found that if you just leave it sit for about another six months, uh, it's even better. So uh, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Uh, for people who are interested in learning more about this subject, uh, here is some of my 45 references that I have on my wine shelf here in front of me. Um, these are some of the most important ones and best ones that I have found in uh, working with uh, all kinds of wines, not just muscadines, but uh, uh, all kinds of wines. Uh, it turns out that uh, you can make wine out of uh, anything that grows, uh, oak leaf wine, uh, walnut leaf wine, 
cabbage wine, dill wine. And I said, I've got five gallons of carrot wine bubbling. You can make it out of beets. You can make it out of berries. You can make it out of anything that grows. The process is the same for making wine. It's flavor extraction. And then it's adjusting of the uh, alcohol and the pH. And then it's the fermentation process. And then it's the stabilizing and bottling and preserving. It's exactly the same process, but quite different in the approaches on how you do those things. So okay. that's some of my references. If a beginner wants to get one book to get started, which one would jump out at you? Which one would you hand them? Um, hmm, which one would I suggest for a beginner? Tough, huh? Well, there's so many of them today. It's, it's hard to, it's actually hard to pick out one. Um, I would say that, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, of course, that we're talking about just muscadines today. And I, I would, while I, he thinks about this, that if you go to a book, bookstore that has a selection of books and you look at them, you know, the, the style of the book and the way it's written and the layout is really personal and it will probably make the decision for you, but, you know. Well, you know, the, 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 the problem I found with most people who've taken my classes, there have been hundreds and hundreds of them over the years, is um, each one of them has a different degree of competency when it comes to understanding chemistry and mycology and things like that. And so they have to find a, a book that's written in a style that sort of is okay and better for them to read and understand. Uh, Jeff Cox put out a book years ago from uh, Vine to Wine that was probably one of the better ones. I have it here on my bookshelf, but I don't have a picture of it here. Yeah, you but do. That, that would probably be my preference for people who want to really get serious about starting to make wine. From It's called From Vine to Wine by Jeff Cox. And that's- You've got, uh, you got a picture of it there. Yeah, um, bottom row, third from the left. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, that's his new book cover. <laughs> okay, sorry, I didn't pick it up. Jeff Cox, yes. Yeah, I have his old one. That's a newer version. Same information, just a prettier cover. <laughs> okay, uh, the other question I get a lot asked is, especially around this area, where can you go to get good winemaking supplies? Uh, this is the one that I frequent all the time in Asheville. Um, they have some knowledgeable people there about making wines and supplies and so forth. Uh, that's their um, contact information. The owner of it is a guy named um, uh, Ted Clevenger. Uh, Ted is a real good uh, brewer of beer and uh, also he's knowledgeable of uh, wine stuff. He's been to some of my classes and so forth. So um, Major cities just about across the state will have some kind of a, uh, a supply shop for winemaking nearby. And if not, uh, go online. Uh, I mean, you can buy anything you want online these days. And, and uh, Asheville Brewer Supply also has a good online store. So I strongly like that. So that being my next to last slide, I'm gonna finish up with this with a little bit of music for you. <laughs> We have some more questions. I don't think you folks can hear them over the <laughs> So anyway, there we go. All right, some more questions. Um, how about using frozen fruit, harvesting the grapes, freezing the current harvest until you have enough grapes to make a five gallon batch or presumably until you have time to do winemaking. And it's the, I way I, it's the way I do it every year. Okay. And I know freezing also releases the juices in a way that stomping on them does not. Well, so. it uh, depends on the grape, but most of the time it does a better job of, uh, of breaking down the cells and uh, freezing. But um, if you leave them in the freezer too long, you start to get some degradation on the quality of it. But um, uh, typically here, because we had to, in the earlier days, not so much now, but we had to just go out and collect maybe two or three pints of grapes when they first started yielding. So you uh, put them in the freezer and, and uh, go on. But uh, any any particular instructions on 
you know, the process of unfreezing and then pressing those grapes? Uh, we put them in uh, one gallon bags and freeze them. Mm -hmm. uh, we take them out, leave them out overnight to thaw them out, uh, throw them in a crusher and press on. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see, we had another question here. Uh, do, um, one person says, I like the idea of making wine from anything. What book would you recommend for that? Uh, the, the best one is probably uh, the one that was just recently released by um, one of the best country winemakers in North America. Uh, his name is Jack Keller. I, I followed his blogs for 20 years. He was, he was North America's absolute best country winemaking guy. Uh, he put together a book called Home Winemaking. It was the one in the upper right-hand corner on that slide where I had my references. It turns out that he died in November before I could have a chance to talk to him because I'm putting together a book that has 200 country wine recipes in it. But Jack Keller has one. His has uh, 25 recipes. Uh, and it uh, includes grapes as well as a number of other fruits and vegetable things that uh, have been thoroughly tested. Um, he, in my mind, is sort of the, the top guy in, in country winemaking in North America for 30 years. Uh, so I'm, I'm sad to lose him, but that'd be, the, that'd be the book I recommend. You can get it on Amazon. I think you can buy it for like 22 bucks called Home Winemaking by Jack Keller. Okay. Um, uh, what do you mean by country winemaking? Is this opposed to like fancy winemaking? Uh, is that an official term? I, I mean, what does country winemaking mean to you? Country winemaking is making literally wine out of everything that grows, including grapes. Muscadine wine, dandelion wine, uh, raspberry wines, carrot wines, dill wines, you know, Ox blood wines. Ugh. Tasted it, not bad. <laughs> the only one, the only one that I'm sad to say, in a way, I never could quite get past the name was when I was visiting a uh, tea plantation in northern India near the Tibet border. Uh, one of my reps up there had some family who had offered us some yak urine wine, and I couldn't get past the name of it to save my life. I just couldn't try that one. <laughs> But I've tried a lot of other interesting wines around the world. Uh, uh, Chuck, there's a lot of discussion here within the, the muscadine industry and amongst, you know, dealing with promotion of muscadines about sweetness of muscadine wine. You know, does muscadine wine need to be sweet? Is it better sweet? Is, is you know, what's the range of sweetness that is, that a muscadine wine can be, because I think a lot of times people's major experience with muscadine wine is with sweet, almost syrupy wines. And yet I know myself, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you want me to really answer that? Yeah, so do you have a preference yourself for how sweet muscadine wine should be? I know you think that sounds like a simple question. <laughs> well, it's a very political question within the muscadine world. So, you know. Well, all right. So let me just get the, the hate forms going out there. Uh, quite frankly, uh, here at our farm, we've had so far this season, I've had um, 150 people come through here and, and they have tasted muscadine half hour. Let, let me correct. Let me, let me put it this way. Uh, since April of this year, I've had 150 visitors come through here. Half of them had tried muscadine wine and hated it. The other half had not tasted muscadine wine, didn't know what it was. Of the ones who tasted it and hated it, they didn't know why they hated it. It just was syrupy, cloyingly sweet. They couldn't stand it. There's a reason that happens. <laughs> It has to do with the sugar you choose. Uh, Debbie, I'm going to catch some heat from this, but I'm telling you, most of the muscadine winemakers in this country use high fructose corn syrup to sweeten their wines 
to chapterize the wines because it's cheap. It also makes it taste like crap. Sorry, it just does. If you want to make good muscadine wine, and there are a few of them in a state who do, you want to use something other than high fructose corn syrup for your chapterizing agent. I have tasted bone dry muscadines wines. They're wonderful. If you have a well-balanced wine, it can be as dry as you want or as sweet as you want. All winemakers have the same tools at their disposal to make it whatever way they want it. And that includes muscadine. It just so happens that muscadine is a Southern grape. As I had mentioned earlier, it grows from Texas to Florida, Eastern Delaware, out to Arkansas. And therefore it's considered a Southern thing. And only in the South, when you go in a restaurant, <clears throat> do you get the waiters to ask you the question, tea, sweet or unsweet? No place else in the world, but that's what happens. So it's known as a Southern grape and therefore it has historically been made as a sweet wine. Doesn't have to be sweet. Like I said, I've tasted some fabulous wines made in this state that are bone dry. It's wonderful. So that's why I use turbinado sugar when I make my wine here. I don't use high fructose corn syrup or other sweeteners. Well, thank you. I, I think that's that's a good explanation of a, of a subject that's you know sort of hotly debated. And for as a home winemaker, should be reassured that you can make wine the way you like it. If yes. you like sweet wine, make it sweet. If you like yep. drier wines, make it dry. Absolutely. And irrespective of what you find in the store, um, uh, you can make it what you want. And, yes. and I agree with Chuck that there's a wide range of muscadine wines that you can find, and most of them are quite sweet. So, um, but the you know I myself like drier wines, and those are the ones I tend to seek seek out. Um, well, not to plug Mark Frizzolowski too much, but he also makes a wonderful sparkling muscadine up at Childress. <laughs> which is something beyond the range of a beginning winemaker yes so. absolutely just so you know i mean you can make muscadine wines into anything you want it can be made as lousy or as great as you want as sweet or as dry as you want higher acidity or not with tannins or not i mean it's up to the winemaker you have 200 over 200 elements that you can play with in making wine even at home to make that wine become what you think is best when you put it in a glass. At the end of the day, I'm not a wine snob, don't like people who think they are either. You put the wine in a glass and you taste it and you either like it or you don't. If you're making your own wines at home, you can make it exactly the way you like it. It might take two or three years to get you where you want to be, but trust me when I tell you, once you get the idea of how to make wine at home and start knowing how to make the adjustments, you'll be able to make perfect wine for your taste and if somebody else doesn't like it, hey, tell them go make their own. So, so if you if you make a batch and you start with say two or three gallons, you can actually vary that batch and make you know a few bottles one way and a few bottles another way, right? So you can make a range of sweetness within within that batch of wine grapes you press, correct? Yes, um, but you're not going to be able to do it if you're only making a gallon. Right. You're going to need some special equipment to do that. If you're if you're making five gallons, you can you can set up a gallon for a little bit more acidic. You can set up a gallon with different kind of sugar. You can set up a gallon with a little bit different yeast nutrient. I mean, um, I used to double batch everything when I was first learning. I was making 18 to maybe 24, 26 six gallon carboys a year of wine, and I would take two batches of Merlot, for example, and just change the yeast. Everything else is the same. I change, uh, take two, two batches of, uh, of Concord and change um, the tannins. I take everything I did double batching and found out which one worked better than the other and say, okay, fine, don't do that anymore. Use this one and just keep on going. And I had a very, very steep learning curve and it allowed me to learn a lot of things in a short period of time as a home winemaker. And, and like I said, I've done thousands, thousands of bottles of wine over the years of all kinds of things from dandelion wines to uh, to uh, vinifera grapes out of Europe. So um, it, it's a process, it's a fun thing. I like it because you can drink your results uh, most of the time. And uh, when it doesn't, I uh, do something else with mine, I turn it into another form of uh, a drinkable liquid called grappa. But hey, uh, that's me. 
So uh, another question and a comment have just come in. Um, uh, Philip Winslow asks, says many muscadine wine recipes call for less fruit and adding water up front with the addition of sugar. Um, I guess you compare that to recipe that you, you shared. Are there any recommendations for using that type of recipe? Uh, Uh, I'm trying that's to think. Like that's not your recommendation. Well, no, let me, that's a good question. I'm just thinking about uh, how best to answer that so they know what, what actually is going on there. Um, I can make muscadine wine out of one cup of muscadine grapes. I can make five gallons. Um, and as long as I've got muscadine flavor in it, it's going to be muscadine wine. I can make five gallons of wine with no muscadines. Won't have muscadine flavor, but it will be wine. Um, and all you're doing is, is putting sugar and water together with the yeast and you're going to generate alcohol. I mean, that's why all the country wines work is you do the flavor extraction that gives you the flavor of whatever it is you're doing from beets to carrots to walnut leaves. Um, and then you, you uh, ferment it. So yeah, you can make it go further, but I'm here to tell you, it doesn't taste anywhere near the same. If you use hundred percent grapes to make your wine, try the very absolute minimal amount of dilution of water you can possibly get away with. That's my two cents on it. All right. So uh, one person again commented, just to try to make sure it's clarification that you never, he says, so never leave skins and seeds in the muscadine must during primary fermentation. For white, take them out immediately. And for red, don't leave them in over than four to six hours. Is that exactly, correct? Exactly right. Because if you remember one of the slides I showed you, there was this uh, funny chemical compound that just makes it nasty if you leave it in there longer than about four to six hours it starts pulling out i made i made wine for three years straight not knowing any better because i was trying to make muscadine wine the same way i've been making other wines for 40 years and it pulled out that stuff and it was so nasty i could not fix it i, I consulted with some of the best winemakers around could not fix it so if you do that there's nothing to do except run it through the still or pour it down the drain i prefer to put mine through a still anyway so that's, that's the way it works. I mean, and uh, uh, if you don't believe it, just try it once. You leave it on for eight or 10 hours and, and <laughs> you'll see what I mean. Uh, another question, should you, wash, should you wash your grapes before you crush them? Uh, that's a personal preference. Um, if you had a lot of birds and a lot of other things running around in your vineyard, like we tend to have from season to season, uh, I just like to rinse mine off. I use, uh, I use distilled water to just sort of give them a quick rinse. Um, once it gets crushed and in there and you've got the alcohol fermenting, it's not going, it's going to kill any of the dangerous virus and bacteria stuff in there. So I don't, I don't worry about it, but you don't have to. I've made wine without it. I've made wine with it. Can't tell much of a difference. Just don't use uh, chlorinated water. Any other questions? Okay. Go ahead, Lisa. Did you have a question? No, I'm good. All right, all right. So um, again, if you don't want to type your question into chat, unmute yourself and blurt it out. Um, at this point, I don't see any more questions in the chat. All right, so uh, just a reminder that we'll be having a second class on Saturday. It's not a continuation of this one. It should be similar, but directed more towards people who have some winemaking experience. Um, although for me, with no winemaking experience, this was certainly technical enough. Um, that, that class will be at Saturday at the same time. And uh, it uses the same link that we sent you for, for this one. Um, and we have one more question that just came in. When does Chuck's book come out? Chuck, you have a <laughs> book coming out? <laughs> uh, it's, I've written two and published already on uh, wine 
evaluation and wine etiquette and that kind of stuff. My third book is, is actually going on one of these Katua muscadines. And the fourth one I'm writing on, which is about 50% done, is my uh, 200 uh, country wine recipe book. And that's my winter work. That's what I do in winter. So my guess is it won't be available for at least another year or so. All right. And um, you'll be able to follow Chuck, I believe, if you check his website. And uh, this, I'm sure he'll let us all know when, when his book comes out. So. If you want to be in my email list, just send me an email. My address, I think, is on the title slide there, I think. And uh, I'll put you on the list and give you an e-blast from time to time of what I'm doing up here on the mountain. So. And uh, I will, um, I will send, share his contact information in the message that gives you all the, the links to the PowerPoint and to the recording of this class. Um, thank you all very much for participating. I learned a lot. I imagine many of you also did as well. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your, uh, <laughs> your participation in this, uh, this uh, class. So uh, stay in touch and uh, make some good wine. Let me know how it works out. Goodbye, everybody.